What does it mean to be post-colonial? A collective thinking on the post-colonial has emphasized the post aspect of the term. And initially, post-colonial was used in the 1970s as a historical reference, indicating the temporal period following colonialism. So pretty straightforward. Over time, however, up until the present day, the understanding of the post-colonial has shifted such that it's now as much or more an ideological term as it is a historical one. And I want to give you first an explanation from Homi Baba, and this is from his 1994 article, our essay, The Postcolonial and the Postmodern, The Question of Agency, and it was published in the Location of Culture. He says, Postcolonial criticism bears witness to the unequal and uneven forces of cultural representation involved in the contest for political and social authority within the modern world order. As you can see, uh, aside from the very first word, postcolonial, there's no mention of the colonial or empire or imperialism or anything following that. Fernando Coronel, an anthropologist and historian of Latin America, unravels the term a bit more for us. First, however, acknowledging that the term itself is a, involves a murky entanglement of knowledge and power. He contends that within the post-colonial, the post functions both as a temporal marker to refer to the problem of classifying societies in historical time, and also as an epistemological sign to evoke the problem of producing knowledge of history and society in the context of imperial relations. Okay, so if Baba's definition brings us to a complicated postmodern world in general, you know, one accessible and inhabited by everyone, um, then Corneille's does a different sort of work for us in refocusing postcolonialism by not looking just at the colonial, but looking at the imperial. And this is going to be one of my key points. Also, for a group of Asianists, I want to mention that it should not go unnoticed that Corneille is a Latin Americanist. Much of the work in colonial studies and postcolonial theory focuses on a very specific understanding of empire, and that is of European empire of the 18th, late 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, and within that period, primarily of British, Dutch, and French empires. So early periods and empires of other countries, especially Spanish and Portuguese in the European case, or concurrent or later non-European empires, such as the United States, Japan, China, Ottomans, um, are often theorized right out of the conversation. Over the last decade, I've been involved in a project that has sought to expand our understanding of empire beyond a focus on just certain European empires in certain periods. Our collective goal has not simply been to add you know, other empires to the list of existing empires in world history, but instead uh, to pull a wider range of imperial formations into the same analytical field and to do so with historical specificity and theoretical validity. In thinking of empires as imperial formations, we intend to open the category and to highlight its processional nature. In thinking that empires were constantly being made and unmade, they were states of becoming, they were polities of dislocation, and they were not steady states of being. They were not polities with consistently clear, coherent courses of action that they were following. Recognizing this is to open empire to a focus on content as much as on form. To perhaps not see empire everywhere, as Baba's definition pushes us, but to pause. And in line with Corneille's language, to ask what a focus on the colonial closes down about the imperial. And I want to really do want to be clear here that I'm drawing on some of the collective work I've done with this group, and more specifically my work with Anne Stoller. Um, Fernando Corneille, whose work I just cited, was also a part of this group. Okay, my focus in thinking through um, from our panel title, our title Empire and the Postcolonial, is Tibet. And some might think Tibet an unusual choice, for Tibet was, as people say in quotes, never colonized. To say this, however, you know, is to reside kind of unconsciously within the unmarked. It's to assume that the reference is Europe, and to assert that Tibet was never colonized by a European power, and again, to read a you know, specific sort and specific time. And it wasn't. Tibet was not colonized you know, by Britain or the Dutch or by the French. However, to not be colonized by Europe is not to have never had an imperial history. So I contend, actually for the much broader and also for the purposes of this paper, that Tibet's imperial history is in fact threefold. For the contemporary period alone, for Tibetan 20th century history, Tibet had and continues to have imperial relations with three countries. The British did not colonize Tibet but they cast their imperial net wide over the country in the form of a forward policy, through which they worked hard to assure favorable policies toward Britain and more specifically toward British India, whether it had to do with trade, um, with drawing the boundaries uh, between Tibet and India, the repercussions of which you know, still very much resonate today. A number of Tibetans also lived in British India, um, primarily in Kalimpong, Darjeeling, and Calcutta, but in other locales as well. 
And even, I mean, their very presence, I think, poses a question that's rarely considered in the colonial studies literature, and that is, what did it mean to live in someone else's empire? So Tibetans lived in colonized India, but they were not colonized themselves. And so therefore had a really different relationship to the state that I think poses interesting questions for us based on everything that we think we know about it, what it meant to be colonial. In the 1950s, now shifting uh, gears for a moment, Tibet became a part of the People's Republic of China. And elsewhere I contend that this relationship has been euphemized in many ways. And think of the term I just used. I said Tibet became a part of the People's Republic of China, and I use that term specifically. Other ones that are commonly used are that Tibet was incorporated into China, or perhaps occupied. And occupied is the one that you know, has the most edge to it, um, but it still avoids using the much stronger term, Tibet was invaded by China, Tibet was colonized by China. And the Chinese term, of course, for the accession you know, of Tibet into the Chinese state is that Tibet was liberated. Now, in this instance, what we see is language serving geopolitics. China's invasion of Tibet, again, a very specific historical and political word choice by myself, took place at the height of decolonization. Okay, so as the rest of the world, especially as specifically European powers, but also Japan, were evacuating, you know, leaving former colonies, and this was the moment of independence of new nations in the world. And the Chinese state unrelentlessly, I mean, just could not stop doing it, used a rhetoric of anti-imperialism just time and again to both justify their presence in Tibet and to shut down outside intervention by ironically categorizing you know, action against the Chinese state as imperialism in advance. Okay, so justified, it, their, justified their own imperial action by using the rhetoric, a very available rhetoric at the time, I might add, of anti-imperialism. And what I argue is that in many ways, we can understand China's current relationship with Tibet as both imperial and as colonial. So the terms decolonization and postcolonial both imply an absence, an absence of empire as well as an absence of colonialism. And I find that the example of Tibet challenges this implication, asking us to think beyond the colonial, not just to think post to it. Um, and in this sense, I actually think the order of the papers, although we didn't know what we were doing back in the spring, is following nicely, perhaps, in me take that even myself. Um, but to think about, like I said, the colonial, um, not just, sorry, think beyond the colonial, not just post to it in understanding empire. So I'm now going to turn to the third way in which Tibet is imperial in the present, and that's through its relationship with the USA. The Cold War provided thick cover for new imperial formations after and throughout the process of European decolonization by positioning themselves against empire, because it wasn't just China that was doing it, it was also the United States. And the United States was also very vociferously saying we are not going to follow you know, in the footsteps of former <coughs> European powers by being colonial. But at the same time, much as China did, use this same political moment of decolonization as a safe space for which to launch new forms of empire. Their anti-imperial discourses. Um, for China, the anti-imperial discourses were also anti-capitalist. For the US, to be anti-imperial meant to be anti-colonial. So it was slightly different. I mean, not just slightly, there were many ways in which they were different, also very important in way, uh, ways in which they intersected. These discourses served to preclude the inclusion of these two states in a possible roster of contemporary empires. And I would argue, even up to the present day, you know, both the United States and the People's Republic of China work very hard to not position themselves as empires. So even in the way that the US claims global power in the present, it doesn't necessarily want to claim imperial power. Chinese and American anti-imperialisms, however, were not abstract, but were specifically directed against European capitalist states. So this was of a specific historical moment, you know, and a uh, particular set of politics. As both political moment and political ideology, the Cold War was really effective in thwarting charges of imperialism against China, including international criticism of China's expansion into Tibet time and again. In private offices in Washington, D.C. and New Delhi, and in public sessions of the United Nations, politici politicians and diplomats refrained from truly acting on charges of imperialism that were brought before them. And people were bringing them, not just Tibetans, but other people were as well. And there wasn't a kind of discursive or political space where they could be to recognize and act it on. Much as Chinese protests against imperialism laid the ground for Chinese takeover of Tibet, and for the absence of serious global critique, which I would argue still you know, continues to the present, American critiques of colonialism underwrote their new empire. As anthropologist Aung San Ho argues, US anti-colonialism is not simply a cloak for US empire, but rather a language that informs the very representation of its imperial authority. 
And if the cover of decolonization made this denial of empire possible, invisibility made its practice feasible. The strategic ambiguity of boundaries surrounding imperial projects, and here I mean specifically American ones, made even overt imperial practices appear invisible. And just think of the places that might be considered US empire, whether it's Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, you know, all of the different and vast territories, including you know, some internal territories within the United States. I mean, these are just not considered in the same analytic or imperial realm as European empires of the same period, or before or after. And so the analytic of political difference, you know, continued past the moment of decolonization. The post-colonial period, because I find it, is marked by domination without colonization, if I can kind of reference Rahiku here, right? Although incorporated territories or new domestic states were allowed. So we weren't calling them colonialism or colonization, but new territories were being incorporated. Right? That's one word that, that is put on the table. And what happened was the cultivation of the sort of influence and action of, you know, that might in an earlier time have been called imperial. It was no longer politely or publicly called imperial. It just couldn't do it. So although American empire is by no means solely a 20th century phenomenon you know, at all, at present U.S. imperialism involves a combination of military action, economic power, and political influence specifically developed in the vacuum left by European decolonization. And this is exactly what happened for Tibet. You know, the British in many ways were kind of Tibet's imperial or certainly European imperial shepherd in the period prior to the 1950s. And the minute they quit India, the Americans stepped into that gap became Tibet's new ally. Okay, one of the most obvious examples that the American empire might rely on invisibility as a strategy is the CIA. And if we look over the last 50 years at the CIA's actions around the world, many of which might qualify as imperial in an earlier decade, we can see striking parallels between earlier, um, earlier imperial actions. American operations in Tibet were not only run by the CIA, so the Department of State was involved and the executive branch as well. They were considered top secret at the time, so they were absolutely invisible. And certainly, I mean, if you can, I can't think in some ways of a place that would be more emblematic of being invisible. Okay, but even today, and CIA relations or operations with Tibet ended in 1968, um, still remain classified and top secret, and no CIA documents on Tibet have been released to the present at all. Okay, so now let me tell you, what is the U.S. CIA connection? All right, so the United States and Tibet only began relations in 1942, um, so just several years before, really, the British quit India. It wasn't until 1942, it was during World War II, when the U.S. wanted to get uh, supplies to troops in China and wanted to fly over Tibetan airspace. And again, I emphasize that to fly over Tibetan airspace, they turned to the Tibetans, right, not to the Chinese. This was a period of Tibetan independence. In the 1950s, they offered aid to the Dalai Lama in the early 50s while he was negotiating with China. He uh, ended up declining American assistance then. And it wasn't until 19, roughly 1957, 1958 that the US started funding the Tibetans. Um, Tibetans had begun uprising against Chinese oppression in the, 19, the period of 1955 and 1956 in eastern Tibet, which was where the reforms, Chinese political reforms were first introduced and became most oppressive there, you know, and then spread western, western toward the rest of Tibet. What the CIA did is they began funding and training these soldiers, and these soldiers were just people from all walks of life who just rose up you know, in their homes, in their villages to fight against. So it wasn't any sort of standing army that existed prior to this time, although there was an uh, official Tibetan army. That was not the group that the CIA was supporting. Um, what they did from 1958 through 1964 is actually both trained, funded, and supported Tibetans uh, who were fighting out of India and Nepal, but also flew Tibetans to the United States right here to Colorado, just not too far away to Camp Hale, which is just less west of Leadville. It was a World War II training site for the 10th Mountain Division. If you've seen the license plates, you can get your, your 10th Mountain Division license plate. This is where the CIA trained Tibetans. They brought them here to Colorado. Um, funding, so they trained them here in Colorado through 1964, and then they continued to fund them in Asia through 1968, right around the time that US and uh, the People's Republic of China were starting to kind of bridge um, relations. Now, once the CIA dropped out, the U.S. continued to support Tibet, and we do provide money to the Dalai Lama, to the exile government, um, as a government. The U.S. Congress has passed all sorts of resolutions on Tibet, but if anyone here you know, knows much about the U.S. Congress, they have the power to pass resolutions and very little power to enforce them. Um, so the executive branch, um, Bush won, 
Senior Bush was the first president to meet with the Dalai Lama, and that was in the spring of 1993. And he set a precedent that has been followed by all US presidents since then, which is to meet with the Dalai Lama as a religious leader, not as a political leader. And that's something that, in general, world leaders do when they meet with him, is that they clearly articulate, you know, as a statement to the Chinese, we are meeting with the Dalai Lama as a religious leader. All right. Um, the U.S. Department of State in the 1960s, so at the same time that they were training the Tibetans, were also working very much behind the scenes with the Dalai Lama's brother and other officials of the Tibetan government to make sure that the Tibetans ran their campaign in a way that met, met American political goals, which meant that they didn't allow, basically they did everything in their power to dissuade the Tibetans from arguing their case as one of state sovereignty. And instead, what they argued is that the, the case should be one of human rights. And so even if you know nothing about Tibet, my guess is that solely by living in Boulder and maybe by having been tuned in for the last decade, you would know that human rights are being violated in Tibet. Right? And that Tibet might need to be freed from something, but state sovereignty has not been put on the table in the way that Tibetans have always from the beginning wanted it to be. You know, they have not just seen this as someone came in and violated our human rights. Yes, but also, we lost our country. That's a matter of sovereignty. Okay, this had this was an American doing actually. Um, happened in night, October of 1962. Is what if we date back to when the U.S. first specifically outright said we will not support you if you try to argue your case as one of state sovereignty. All right. So what does this mean for Tibetans? What does it mean, you know, to have this connection to the United States, but at the same time to be living in a post-colonial India, in, in, in a Baba, you, can I say a Babian? How, do you, how would you make a Homi Baba into a, an adjective? Um, word. So to combine this US presence, both the government, the quiet, restrained report it gets, but also the citizen activism, you know, it certainly emanates out of this country, um, and, and to be living in a very post-colonial India at the moment. I think I mean, we see a combination of passions, of confusions, of tensions. We see a commitment to the nation state you know, of Tibet. Um, Tibetans aren't citizens in South Asia. They're not citizens in either India or Nepal. Even if you are born there, you are not um, qualified to become a citizen, although each country has that in its constitution, that if you are born in India, then you have a right to become a citizen in the same in Nepal. So it's very interesting. Tibetans fall outside of even what's constitutionally guaranteed, supposedly, to people in these countries. Um, but they very much, at the same time that they don't want citizenship, and so this is also somewhat of Tibetans doing, it's not just something um, adjudicated down to them, desiring citizenship in the West. And what we really have seen in the last 10 years are Tibetans moving out. So now the diaspora is spreading beyond South Asia to places like Boulder, New York, Minneapolis, the Bay Area, Toronto. And if you come over here, you better believe that the Tibetan government is going to support you in seeking citizenship in this country. Although they don't want you to get it. These kinds of contradictions. So this is what it means to be post-colonial. Commitment to military defense. In India, Tibetans serve um, or compose the Special Frontier Force in the Indian Army. It's an all-Tibetan force. They are not citizens of the Indian state, but they have their own military unit um, that was founded in 1962. Uh, they also serve in the Indo-Tibetan Border Police, which is a form of a force that combines Indian citizens with Tibetans, and that's a division of the Ministry of Home. They also serve in U.S. Armed Forces, and there are Tibetans who are um, U.S. Marines, and there are Tibetans who serve in the U.S. Army. And the reference for me as I you know, try to make sense of this is thinking of the Gorkhas. And again, Nepal, a country that was right, never colonized, but there are Gorkha forces today in the Indian Army and in the British Army. And they are serving as U.N. peacekeepers around the world. They are everywhere. Anywhere there is a military conflict going on in the world right now, I can guarantee you that there are Nepali Gorkha soldiers fighting in it. And again, a never colonized people. Um, but isn't Tibet a nonviolent cause? Okay. Um, so there's a commitment to nonviolence. At the same time, if you type in Tibet hunger strike, what's going to pop up on your Google screen is the fact that there's a hunger strike going on right now in New Delhi. Maybe there was one last week with Tibetans sitting outside the United Nations in Geneva or New York. So drawing very much on Buddhist principles of nonviolence, but also Gandhian ones. And so therefore, again, kind of this post-colonial, but also anti-colonial energy coming from Indian place, and then also Tibetan. Um, at the same time, and here's again that yeah, that, that contradiction, the Dalai Lama asserts that hunger strikes are not nonviolent in form, and that in fact he speaks out against these and says that it's a violence to the self, it's a violence to your own body. And so he does not support hunger strikes as a form of nonviolent protest for Tibetans. So commitment to political action and agency. This is one of the four things. But I agree with uh, Buddhist scholar Donald Lopez, 
who argues that Tibetans have become prisoners of Shangri-La. And the myth of Shangri-La is something that says that Tibet is a remote, forbidding place where people have learned how to you know, harness time and harness youth and, and live forever and be happy, shiny people. This, this sort of idea. And that if Tibetans um, aren't going to, you know, they know how to save themselves and perhaps they can save the world. So it's, there's this real um, fascinating salvation myth that's attached to Shangri-La that he argues Tibetans have become prisoners of. What it means is that they've become to have the moral high ground you know, in terms of political struggle in the world today, but they have no political traction. There's not a single state in the world that supports the Tibetan cause other than in, you know, under the radar, you know, sort of ways. Um, the United States, India, Nepal. Just yesterday, you know, the Nepali government, the new Nepali Maoist government, right, announced that it was going to send back to Tibet any Tibetans there without any identification cards. Well, guess what? The last time the Nepali government issued identification cards to Tibetans was roughly in 1986. So the whole idea of being sent back someplace, potentially to some place where you have never been, right? This, this to be, it's not just to be a refugee, but, but to be post-colonial, to try and get at this sense of um, kind of calling attention to contemporary forms of empire, contemporary forms of post-colonial that don't necessarily rest on, on being colonial or, or post but really trying to understand it in a new way. What is empire without colonialism? What sort of subjects does an empire without colonialism produce? You know, what are the new imperial forms at present? You know, we haven't quite come to terms with them yet because we're in the midst of them. And it's much easier you know, to see, to analyze, and to understand in hindsight. It's much harder to do this on the ground you know, while it's still taking place. How do we theorize the post-colonial, right? not just at an abstract level, but also at a lived, embodied, everyday level? How do we understand, for example, to come back to something I just shared with you, the Tibetan choice to live without the rights of citizenship in post-colonial India, but to actively seek them in the US, Canada, or the UK, without solely seeing this as you know, some sort of political strategy? You know, obviously, to travel the world with a US passport versus a Nepali one is a, is a qualitatively <laughs> different experience. But it's not just about that. You know, how do we see this as an imperial commentary, as something that's linked to India's, for example, governmental sense of the self? in choosing not to sign on to any of the UN conventions on refugees, in choosing to, to set up a, an out of the con extra constitutional you know, sort of relationship with the Tibetans, um, in terms of American global hegemony and the desire not to be seen as imperial but to be seen as powerful and to, to have that, you know, that marionette hand in some ways kind of driving things. Chinese historical rhetoric in that China now no longer just says Tibet needed to be liberated in Marxist or feudalist terms but historically it has been a part of China, and that's something new. <laughs> you know, that sort of historical claim to be new, you're just deconstructing that again as an imperial formation. Um, and in general, just thinking about post-World War II discourses of nation, independence, and agency as being part of this, and as, as the post being something that you know, is never a, a, a stark break, but as something that in a more Foucauldian sense perhaps is a rupture, so looking at the elements of continuity that, that come with the new. And what I want to suggest, then, perhaps, I don't know if it's um, unusual or not, but a return to Baba's definition, um, but to tweak it with Cornell's understanding of imperial formations. And I want to just read Baba one more time, now with this new idea of thinking more broadly about the imperial in the present. And it says, post-colonial criticism bears witness to the unequal and uneven forces of cultural representation involved in the context for political and social authority within the modern world order. I see that entirely as what Tibetans are both struggling for and struggling against. But I think to understand that and to see how it's lived, right, not just how it's um, governed, perhaps, we need to open up, like kind of percorneal our understanding of the, of, of the imperial, not just the colonial. And in opening our analyses to empire by other means and perhaps by other names, I think we can see with new eyes for Tibet but also for elsewhere because this is by no means only a Tibetan story, the painful inequalities of empire and its unflagging persistence in the present. <laughs>